The average age of the NBA athlete is roughly 24 years old. The average age of the NBA athlete to rupture their Achilles tendon is about 29.3. It's estimated that somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000 people tear their ACL every year. And while Achilles tears aren't anywhere near that level, it's obvious that the numbers for this injury are on the rise as well. And let's be honest, in a best case scenario, with an ACL or Achilles tear you're looking at a grueling 9, 12, or even as long as 18 month rehab process. And in a worst case scenario, it could be career ending. That's why I wanted Adam Petway to come on the podcast. Adam has probably spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours watching game film and diving deep into the mechanisms behind both ACL and Achilles tears, and what he's found is pretty darn cool. Adam is in his 12th year of coaching and currently works as the head strength and conditioning coach for the Louisville men's basketball team. Prior to his time with the Cardinals, Adam has also spent time working in the NBA with both the Philadelphia 76ers and the Washington Wizards. So it's safe to say he knows a thing or two about injuries in basketball. Now, if you're a regular to the show, welcome back. As always, love and appreciate you. And if you're new here, welcome. I'm Mike Robertson, and this is the Physical Preparation Podcast. In this show, we take deep dives into the art and science of coaching, cueing, program design, business, and personal development. Basically, anything to help you become a better trainer, coach, or rehab professional. Now, as a coach who has helped athletes come back from both ACL and Achilles tears, I know how challenging the rehab process can be. So anything I can do to learn about better prevention or reduction of these injuries is a huge, huge deal for me. Now, here's an interesting nugget. Did you know there's one specific pattern you see in basically every Achilles tear in basketball? And while not quite as predictable, Adam has also found that there are three primary scenarios that occur when an athlete tears their ACL as well. So in this podcast, we're going to take a deep dive into how these injuries occur and then spin off and talk about strategies that we can use as trainers and coaches to prevent them. The bottom line is this. If you work with athletes and want to help them stay healthy on the field, court, or pitch, you're going to love this episode. Now, before we jump into this week's episode, I want to give you a quick recap of the week that was, what's new in my neck of the woods, because man, there has been a lot going on the past 7 to 10 days. It all started last weekend, headed out to beautiful West Hartford, Connecticut, got to hang out with my guy Steve Calarco, aka the best dressed man in fitness, and we put on what was my third complete coach seminar for this year, so First one in Huntsville, Alabama with my boy Andy McCloy. Number two in Slovenia with my guy Matej Hasevar. And this being the third, man, it really doesn't like wear off. Like it's so much fun doing these seminars. I think the great thing about them is I have like a, a general overview or an outline of things that I want to cover. But then I've got a lot of wiggle room built in there. I've got a lot of ways where, hey, if a certain group wants to talk more about speed, like we did in Huntsville, we can focus on that. In this particular seminar, we had a lot of questions about coaching, cueing, modifying activities. We did like an entire hour just on conditioning, how to write better conditioning programs for the clients and athletes that we work with. So, I mean, these don't get boring, right? Like they very much keep you on your toes as a presenter. I love it because it's way more interactive. I'm not just sitting there, you know, talking from PowerPoint slides all day. We might use the slides to guide us a little bit up front, but then once the concepts and the principles are in play, now we can really dive in and problem solve and strategize to help whoever attends get the most out of the course. So big shout out to Steve. Thanks so much for having me, guy. Thank you to all the attendees. It was awesome and I hope you guys enjoyed it. So already trying to uh, plan the next one. It's not going to be until March uh, as far as as far as I know, but just saying, if you like Seattle and you like my guy Luca Hasvar, be on the lookout because we should have an announcement here hopefully very soon. So long weekend, long days, very much worth it, but then came back. Uh, I'm putting on a speed camp for Kendall and some of her former soccer teammates. That's been a ton of fun. 
Uh, we are literally two sessions in, but this is always something that I envision myself getting back into as my kids got older. You know, it's a certain it's a certain thing when they're young, right? And I'm coaching their sports teams, but now as they're getting older and other people are coaching them in sports, now it just makes sense. I can start working with them more on the speed, strength, and agility piece. So we've had two sessions now. Absolutely love getting in the gym, teaching these young ladies how to move more efficiently. Obviously, it's about speed because every soccer player, basketball player, football player wants to be faster. But man, it's just really teaching them how to move more efficiently, more effectively, and hopefully give them some of the fundamentals that I didn't get when I was growing up, whether it's in regards to speed development or just general strength and conditioning. So I'll definitely be giving you more updates on that. It's been great so far. And then (laughs) pretty short week because I got back Sunday night here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and I'm actually leaving tomorrow, which is Thursday, uh, to head out to Joel Jameson's Certified Conditioning Coach Workshop in Las Vegas. Now, if you know anything about me, you know I really like to stagger my travel. Uh, I rarely travel twice in the same month, let alone in back-to-back weeks. A lot of times I'll travel like once a quarter or once every other month, so got to be a pretty big deal, but when Joel asked me to come out, not only to help him present, but also that we were going to get to hang out and present at the UFC Performance Institute. It was kind of a no-brainer. So really pumped for that this weekend. I am doing what I call R7 2099. So if you follow the Marvel comics, you know there's like OG Spider-Man, and then there's like the 2099, like the tweaked out modern version. Or maybe a better representation is if you remember the original Iron Man, You know, when Iron Man first creates the Iron Man suit, it's all clunky and awkward and it's like skins like, you know, kind of hanging out there to by the time he's at like version 85, which is in Infinity Wars. It's like nanotech and all kinds of crazy, crazy weaponry. That's kind of what this R7 talk is going to be. It's kind of a mishmash of the OG R7 talk, some of the R7 materials that I put into the complete coach cert. And then just new stuff, new things I'm thinking about, new ways I'm applying certain aspects of R7 to hopefully get better results to the clients and athletes that I work with. So, man, all kinds of good stuff going on. I know I'm going to be smashed next week between the travel, the jet lag, just being up in a, you know, different time zone. Joel and I are on very different schedules, but man, definitely looking forward to it. And I will definitely give you a recap when I get back. So we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to jump into this awesome episode with my guy, Adam Petway. Today's episode of the Physical Preparation Podcast is brought to you by Hawken Dynamics. Hawken Dynamics consider themselves part of the process, not the process. Force plates are in no way, shape, or form new technology, but Hawken has brought them to the 21st century. Hawken Dynamics plates are wireless, which makes them portable and easy to set up and use. You'll have the ability to performance test your athletes in a matter of seconds and give them immediate feedback on their strengths and weaknesses. And last but not least, their software interface is clean, intuitive, and easy on the eye so both you and your athletes can visualize what's going on and how to improve their performance. Now, the reason I invested in Hawken Dynamics Force Plates was simple. I was tired of feelings and subjective information being the sole driver of my decision-making process. At this point in my career, I want a blend of both subjective assessments and objective driven metrics to drive my program design. I love the idea of having dual force plates so you can see side to side differences and asymmetries, especially in athletes who are in the return to play process. I want to be able to collect and track data across the athletic spectrum, from our young kiddos to my elite athletes that are playing in the NBA or MLS. Another driver for me was finding ways to assess performance that aren't reliant on lifting technique. While I would never bring a kid in and test their 1RM squat or deadlift on day one, I have zero issue putting them on force plates to test their power in a vertical jump or their force output in a mid-thigh pull or iso squat. But arguably the biggest driver for me was being able to take all of this technology and making it incredibly easy to use. With options to lease or buy, Coupled with a five-year warranty, I'm confident that Hawken Dynamics Force Plates can take your performance facility to the next level. To learn more, head over to hawkendynamics.com or follow them on Instagram at hawkendynamics. 
or for direct sales inquiries, feel free to reach out to Drake Berberet directly at drake at hawkendynamics.com or follow him on Instagram at strength2.speed. Adam, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Really excited to have you on. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks, Mike. I really appreciate you having me on. Um, you know, my my background I actually started as a uh, high school basketball coach. So my first job out of college was at John Carroll Catholic High School in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, I was the ninth grade boys coach, head coach, tactically, X's yeah. and O's. Yeah. And uh, I, I ran the strength and conditioning for ninth grade JV and varsity. And, and what I found was uh, I really liked the physical preparation and uh, that aspect more than the tactical X's and O's, right? Yep. Um, so, so from there, I went to a Division three school where I was kind of kind of reversed. I was an assistant coach, but I was also the director of strength and conditioning. So uh, it was a really good experience for me because it gave me the opportunity to, uh, you know, I, I was scouting, I was recruiting, you know, I was yep. doing a lot of the operation stuff like, uh, you know, planning hotels on the road and things like that. So it gave me a different perspective while I was also doing all the strength and conditioning and physical preparation for the men's basketball team. Right. Yep. Um, but again, I, I knew even though I was doing some of the tactical work, uh, I was so passionate about strength and conditioning and physical preparation that I knew that's the, uh, the route I wanted to go down. Um, so, so from there um, I had my first opportunity to work at uh, division one strength and conditioning program at George Washington University, um, working for a guy named Ben Kenyon, who's actually now the head strength coach for the Philadelphia 76ers. And he, yeah. he was awesome, man. He gave me my first shot. You know, he, he showed me, you know, how to use Excel, how to program, you know, some different methodologies that I still use today and just being, you know, a good person and a professional. Um, so I'm very, very grateful for my time there. Um, after George Washington, uh, I had the opportunity to work for a guy named Kyle Tarp at the University of Maryland, and he was the first true like basketball performance coach. You know, he studied uh, under a guy named Todd Wright, um, you know, at the University of Texas. And he, he the one that exposed me to, hey, you know, um, he was in every film session. He was at every practice and game. You know, he was really studying the game um, and how that transferred to what you can do in the weight room and vice versa. Um, so very grateful for my two years there. Um, after the University of Maryland, um, I went down to Arkansas and spent five five years there. And, uh, you know, had a great opportunity to work for a great guy, Mike Anderson. Uh, you know, good mentor, uh, great coach, great man. Learned a lot from him in my five years there. Um, but also had the opportunity to be exposed to a lot of really good speed power. Mm. Um, so during my time there um, in the 2016 Rio Olympics, I believe our track and field team at Arkansas had eight student athletes, not not pros coming back, kids that were actually in, in school at the time um, compete in the Rio Olympics. Uh, oh the, Omar McLeod won the 100 meter high hurdles gold medal. Uh, Sandy Morris won the pole vault on the women's side. Jerry and Lawson placed in the long jump. So we just had, and that's not to mention guys like, you know, um, Tyson Gay and Wallace Spearman and Veronica Campbell Brown that were alumni that, that were competing. So, you know, you could go out to the track on any given Saturday and see, you know, 12 or 14 Olympians. You wow. know, <laughs> that's lose. cool. Yeah, so, so it was awesome. And then, you know, I had the opportunity to train a lot of uh, post-collegiate kids that would come back and were competing for world champs and Olympics. So that that really kind of shaped um, a lot of my thought process in trying to blend a lot of speed power methodologies with, you know, tra training basketball athletes. So that was, you know, really good experience uh, for my development. Um, crazy how it comes full circle. For, from there, I had the opportunity to um, – work for the Philadelphia 76ers for a guy named Todd Wright, who's now the VP for the, the LA Clippers. You know, he called me up, said, Hey, we're building out a biomechanics department. You know, we hear you're getting your PhD and a lot of the things we're trying to build out here. Would you like to join our team? And I was like, absolutely. And I learned so much from him and a, a guy named uh, Tagore Pandolf, who's now with the Orlando Magic, um, you know, just being very specific to basketball, again, cutting up film, understanding the movements of the game, understanding dribble handoffs and ball screen situations. Um, and just, you know, understanding, you know, the tactical aspects of the game and how that affects performance and vice versa. 
Um, and, and then from, from there, spent a year with the, the Wizards in D.C. as the director of athletic performance. Um, moved back to Philadelphia, was uh, <laughs> the, uh, the horizontal jumps coach at Westchester. So back in speed power, I was coaching the triple and the long jump. A um, lot of really good resources on that campus. Uh, a guy named Ken Clark's a really get, great researcher for Speed Power. Does one of the best sprint biomechanists, you know, in, in North America. So I had the opportunity to collaborate with him. Um, and you know, I got a call last uh, last spring. One one of my mentors um, in Speed Power, a guy named Bush Schneider, who I, I know you've had yeah. on the show. Probably my biggest influence. Um, from, from a training standpoint, um, called me up and said, Hey, I recommended you a, a job at uh, Louisville. And I said, Oh, great. You know, what, what's their best, like triple and long jump marks. I assumed he was talking about, right. you know, speed power. And he was like, no, no, it's for men's basketball. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> awesome. And, uh, so kind of, kind of, uh, start, started talking a little bit and, you know, our, our head coach, coach Payne, you know, he's a, he's a very unique thinker was looking for somebody with a track and field background that also knew basketball. And he said, man, your name just keeps popping up. You know, you ready to do this thing? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So now I'm um, going on month three here at the University of Louisville working with men's basketball. I love it, man. Dude, that is such a cool, cool uh, career arc, if you will. But can, let's go back even before that for a second. Like what got you into the world of physical preparation yourself? Right. Like, how did you get started in all this? Obviously, you said you started in basketball and you were a basketball coach. But like, what got you passionate about this side of it in the in the beginning? Yeah. You know, I think training myself and just being immersed in the culture, you know, I just just having the opportunity to learn from so many great people and and just try to problem solve objectively um, from, from a mechanical standpoint and from a physiological standpoint, you know, the, the X's and O's are great. And, you know, drawing up a great, you know, baseline out of bounds or sideline out of bounds, you know, is, is a beautiful thing or understand defensively how to help the helper or be in good position. But but for me, it's all about movement. It's all about, you know, biomechanics. It's all about physiology. I just have always had a passion to understand, like, what makes great athletes great. And the physical preparation behind that is, is just something that I've always had a passion for. You know, the games are the games, you know, and they're they're fun, obviously, but the preparation you put in, you know, from a biomechanical standpoint and from a physiological standpoint is just something I've just always been extremely passionate about. You know, when you say that, it reminds me, or it makes me think, you know, a lot of times I think the people that get into coaching are the ones that enjoy the preparation as much, if not more than the actual games, right? They just like being in the gym. They like getting ready. They like putting in the work. And, you know, like, that's what coaches are, right? Like, I love just being in the gym and working with guys. And it's cool to watch them play, like you said, but I just like the work and get helping them get better. Yeah, you know, it takes what it takes, man. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, we, we've got a 40-minute game tomorrow. It, it's probably been 40 hours of preparation leading up to that game. You know yep. you know what I'm yep. saying? Especially Absolutely. in the preseason, the way everything breaks down. Uh, you know, we, we put a lot of preparation into – you know, uh, the, where the competitions are almost like an afterthought. They're fun, but, you know, immersing yourself in the process is always the best part, you know. For sure. All right. So big things I want to talk to you about here today are ACL tears and Achilles tears. Obviously, you are in basketball. You've seen uh, probably more of this than you would like to uh, see. And I'm really interested, like just for starters, as an overview, like what got you into researching these topics? Yeah, you know, it, it all started, um, you know, two years ago in Philadelphia. I was just going uh, to have coffee with our former medical director uh, for the 76ers. His name is Scott Epsley, brilliant physiotherapist from Australia. And we would just have these really in-depth conversations about just various things in performance and medical and basketball. Um, and, and we just started this dialogue. And uh, I was like, man, you know, the, these injuries are just like, growing exponentially with, yep. within the game of love. You know, I, I think before we can talk about prevention, I think we need to understand the mechanisms behind these injuries, right? So we just started pulling clips of film. Um, we started with Achilles and starting in the year 1993, we just pulled video of every Achilles tendon rupture in the NBA um, o- over a span of uh, 30 years, right? And we, we pulled, we found 
31 incidents and of those we got 18 clips of that happened in game and we just started looking okay like what are they doing when they're they're getting injured um you know what what does that look like is there contact or non-contact um is there any consistencies right you look for common denominators and once we started kind of doing this process and having like a film review um you know we really started to see some patterns and trends throughout the course of uh yeah, you know, the uh, about a 30 year period in Achilles tenants. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you said you've gone through, you've broken down these game films. And, and again, I'm kind of playing this up because you, you've been very gracious and kind of shared this, uh, this article with me before it goes to print. But like, what are we seeing biomechanically when somebody tears an Achilles? I'm like you said, there's probably some some specific postures or positions we're seeing. So what are those? Yeah, so with, with the Achilles tendon ruptures, 100% of the time is actually this negative step or false step mechanism, right? Where the athlete would take a step behind their center of mass before projecting horizontally, right? Um, this was coupled with extreme dorsiflexion where the heel hits the ground, a positive shank angle and trunk flexion, right? So <clears throat> this was non-contact injuries where the athlete were, was taking this false step or negative step 100% of the time. Um, so that, that was glaring to us. Now, I, I think we need to understand more about the tensile properties of the tendons and the contractile proteins and everything associated with this injury. So we're not suggesting that this false step or, you know, negative step mechanism shouldn't be trained or it should be avoided. We just, uh, we need to understand the mechanical properties involved before we can have interventions or suggestions to kind of prevent or reduce the likelihood of this injury occurring, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting too, because like you said, this is something one of my athletes dealt with an Achilles tear last year. He's back in the NBA this year. So I really dove into this over the last year, year and a half myself. And it's interesting because the other thing too is, I mean, you said you go all the way back to like 1993. Like one of the first really successful recoveries from this was Dominique Wilkins. Yeah, yeah. And so just thinking about, like, that was one of the things that I asked myself immediately is like, okay, this guy 30 years ago tears his Achilles. I mean, just think about where we were 30 years ago training-wise, right? Mm -hmm. And for him to go through the surgical process, the rehab process, and he came back and had arguably one of his best career years of all time. So I think that's what's fun about this too. Obviously, you never want to hear an athlete get injured, but like, okay, putting yourself in this mindset of, okay... What can we do to help prepare them to come back at the highest level of sport? So I don't know if you're privy to this, but one thing I am constantly asking myself is beyond just the positions that they're in, right? Are there anything that you have found either in the literature or in talking to other strength coaches uh, that might underpin this? Maybe it's asymmetries in strength or neuromuscular control, mobility. Are there any other things beyond the biomechanical factors that you found that maybe lead up to this? Yeah, so we took all known factors and distribution of known factors uh, as far as uh, games played, uh, you know, chronological age. When did it happen within the year? Uh, points per game was there a spike in minutes per game in the 10 games and 30 games leading up to injury and when when you run the statistics like really the only thing we can say uh, for certain that may be a potential risk factor is that older athletes are more at risk than younger athletes so the average age of the NBA athlete is roughly 24 years old the average age of the NBA athlete athlete to rupture their Achilles tendon is about 29.3. So we found mm -hmm. older athletes were more predisposed to this injury risk. A lot of them, you mentioned Dominique, and he fit the model and had, yeah, arguably one of his best years after kind of changing his game. Uh, but I believe it was roughly about 35% of these Achilles tendon ruptures, uh, you know, ended careers, Isaiah yeah. Thomas, Ewing, um, et cetera, et cetera. So there was some degrees of variance as far as uh, these injuries. But as we get you know, more advanced, like you mentioned, um, you know, these athletes are coming back quicker from, you know, this devastating injury. And they're also having very, very productive careers post injury. Um, so that that's the good thing. Again, you know, the, the visceral response that you get from a film review like this is just devastating because not only it, it's like you said, like I've been associated with some of these cases that I had to go back and watch. And I know 
you know, for the athlete and the athlete's family and the support staff and the coaching staff, like everything that's involved with these catastrophic injuries. Um, so, so again, the visceral response you get from watching these injuries is devastating. But I think before we understand how to truly like maybe prevent some of these injuries, we need to understand, you know, the biomechanics and the mechanisms involved with what's going on when they get injured. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think the other thing that Makes me a little bit more positive about this because, again, Ed was probably the first athlete that I had had that had, had any sort of really major injury like this is going back and then you start to see now, like you alluded to, an Isaiah Thomas or a Patrick Ewing. It's a career-ending injury, but now so many of these guys are coming back and they are having productive years on the back end of this, right? So a uh, Rudy Gay, uh, the yeah. most the most positive example we have right now, Kevin Durant, it right? Is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean... Now, granted, he had uh, an, an extended time off, I think, because of like COVID and some other stuff in there, maybe. But man, I mean, that guy came back, and at least from what I see on a basketball court, he looks pretty damn good out there. So yeah, he's looking great. Yeah, so there is a lot of positivity coming out of this. Um, you, you know, I, I think, yeah, I, I think as we understand these injuries more, and there are some more successful rehab cases that you know, hopefully. You know, it, it will be a thing, you know, moving forward that, yeah, it's, it is common. Like, Katie's the norm, not the exception, you know? Right, right. Okay, so as a strength coach, as a physical preparation coach, what things do you feel like we can be doing from a training perspective uh, to help better prepare our athletes? You mentioned kind of the false step, uh, plyo step, whatever we want to call it. What kind of interventions can we start layering or adding into our programs you think that might help us stave some of this off? And again, this is so hard, right? Like a lot of this is conjecture. We can talk right. about injury prevention versus injury reduction. But like if you had to give me an answer right now, what do you feel like you would be putting in your program to help keep some of these injuries at bay? Yeah, I think first off is build a relationship and understand you know, the technical development aspects, right? So yeah. it's just like a, a lot of the skill development coaches have a big time role in, you know, um, these movement patterns and, you know, either training them to go to these movement patterns in a very safe manner or training them not to go into certain positions at certain times, right? So for example, with, with the false step, it, it's going to occur in basketball, this negative step. So making sure you don't strike too far behind your center of mass and you do so with a nice stiff rigid foot where it yeah. doesn't collapse down and has a lot of like a uh, poor damping ratio and very lax yep. uh, foot is it, something very, very important. Now you can train that in a controlled environment from an SNC and physical preparation standpoint, but I would also implore all SNC coaches and physical preparation coaches to go to the technical development coaches and how do you see this? Like what, what does this look like to you? And like, how can we either, you know, make sure if the athlete's going to go there, they do so in a very safe manner, you know? Yeah. So I think, you know, let's say, I don't know, maybe we put it in our program, you know, we, we might exposure once a week, three sets of five. Well, if they're putting up a thousand shots a day, <laughs> and doing it, you know, cone drills and dribble drives and penetrations and ball screen situations, they might get 120 exposures to that on the court, right? Yeah. So a controlled environment, I, I would say collaborate with the technical coaches to create a model where they're doing that maneuver in a very safe manner. Yep. Okay, one last question. ISOs, what role do they play? Because obviously we know they're beneficial, like these long duration ISO holds for yeah. tendinopathy, that sort of thing. Is this something you would recommend people put in their programs for their basketball or volleyball players that are jumping a lot? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think ISOs are very uh, low central fatigue and it's very easy to teach, right? So yeah. I think I think isometrics are definitely for having a stiff, rigid foot and make sure that like foot and ankle complex doesn't hit the ground with laxities. I think I think isometrics are a great way to kind of train uh, that safe mechanism, you know, in a yeah. way that's uh, again, it's very easy to teach and it's very low central fatigue. So I, I think isometrics during season are a, a great way to kind of uh, facilitate some of these adaptations. I love it. Okay, let's switch gears a bit. Let's talk about some ACLs. 
So again, you've dug into this. You've, I'm sure, <laughs> looked at way more ACL tears on video than you'd like to remember. What are yeah. some of the biomechanical things that we're seeing in an ACL tear? Yeah, so th this study actually, the film analysis went back to 1985 was the first one we pulled um, and uh, all the way up to, you know, as recently as last season or this summer. Um, and, and what we found is there wasn't one distinct mechanism. There was actually three that we found, right? Okay. Um, the single leg casting mechanism was the most common where the athlete would strike way in front of their center of mass on one leg with an extremely dorsiflexed ankle and a lateral trunk flexion towards the side of the affected limb, right? Okay. Um, so essentially a single leg striking well in front of the center of mass, right? With a very dorsiflex ankle and lateral trunk flexion towards the side of injury. Um, the second one was a two foot landing or like a pro hop, yep. right? Where you land again, way in front of the center of mass, but with trunk extension, uh, the trunk extension was about nine or 10 degrees. So it wasn't much, but usually you're with possession of the basketball getting into your shot pocket. Yeah. So you're pro hopping again, dorsiflexed in front of the center of mass and, and going through trunk extension as you landed. Uh, the last one and the hardest one to account for was uh, aerial contact with swing leg abduction. So essentially you go up typically with the basketball trying to get, uh, you know, a foul or a bucket at the rim, you get hit while you're in the air, your swing leg abducts to slow rotation so you don't fall and like break your neck. Um, and then you just land on a single leg with a lot of rotational forces and shearing forces going through um, the knee joint, and then you tear your ACL. So, so again, hard to account for, but that aerial contact with swing leg abduction was the third and least common mechanism but again, the hardest one to control for, you know, because that's just kind of embedded in the game, you know. Not to speak exactly on this, but that sounds similar to what happened to Clay Thompson, right? That's the one that comes to mind in the NBA finals, like went uh, up to dunk uh, or whatever, got clipped, landed awkwardly. Yeah, Danny Green. Yeah, again, so hard to account for and, and just like really just devastating um, injury, but still one that uh, occurred less frequently than the other two, but was a pattern, you know? Yeah, yeah. that's cool that you've got it down to these three. So kind of coming back to that same idea of, okay, you've got the biomechanical models in place. As you're going through this research, as you're going through, I can't even imagine how much ACL research <laughs> on the back end as well. Yeah. What are some maybe like core to live info or data that we have as far as maybe athletes movement, that would perhaps put them at an increased risk of ACL tears because it's been a while since I've dug dug into that rabbit hole. Yeah, so I, I think the main thing going again back to technical development, striking well outside um, the base of support or the center of mass was uh, just a, a risk factor across the board, right? So again, if you're a direct line drive, whether you land on one foot or two, if you're striking well in front of your center of mass and really extremely dorsiflexed, uh, excessive breaking horizontal forces are being created and the, uh, the likelihood of shearing forces at the knee joint um, are going to be increased, right? So uh, again, I think, you know, having the ability to take risks in direct line drives, but doing so where you strike um, at least not underneath your center of mass, but not where it's like, okay, um, you know, the Scandinavian research was great with this and, and uh, ACLs and tears in female handball. They had a ratio of where the distance where you would uh, touch down relative to the distance of your center of mass. Right. Mm -hmm. So if that, that ratio was outside of like one or one point two, you were at predisposed risk. So let's say your center of mass to the ground was let's just say one meter. Right. If you were striking one point two meters in front of your center of mass that was a predisposed risk uh, mm. factor, right? Okay. So again, um, I, I think the the technical and skill development coaches, like if you're teaching direct line drives, I think having contingencies and technical models built in to where you're in a safe position when you're driving, when you're landing, when you're cutting is just extremely important. Um, the second thing is the role of the trunk. I don't think, I don't think um, a lot of practitioners really understand Pro hop was coupled with trunk extension to about nine or 10 degrees. Single leg casting was lateral flexion up to like 17, 18 degrees, right? 
So it's like, again, if you're striking well in front of your center of mass and your trunk is not stable, that was also, um, you know, a, a potential risk factor. So I, I think people don't think of the trunk when they think of like ACL injuries, but that was consistently um, a trend that we saw from a biomechanical standpoint when we did our film analysis. Hmm. Okay. So this might be hard to gauge, but I'm interested. Like obviously a lot of the assessments that we would do maybe on a force plate or in the gym would involve, for the most part, the, the feet being underneath the hips, right? Mm -hmm. So right. is there any way to like quantify this stuff, right? Where you, unless you've got like a basketball <laughs> court that's also a force plate, right? I'm just trying to think yeah. about how we could like get some ideas to the forces that are going on or just kind of like get an idea as to, hey, is there any way we can like basically say oh, this person's at increased risk outside of, you know, this really exaggerated step width or something like that? Yeah, you know, there's... It, from a standardized, repeatable neuromuscular assessment, nobody loves, you know, a hands on hip counter movement jump more than I do. Um, is that going to tell you, are they at potential risk? Or are they a risk taker? You know, I, I don't know. I haven't looked into it that much. I think, you know, asymmetry and the ratio of like breaking versus propulsive forces in a counter movement jump, great place to start. And it's something you can measure every single day. But I also think coupling that with like a more insight to evaluation with like, OK, when this athlete drives, do they land on one, one leg or two? Do they usually pro hop or do they usually cast? Are they a two foot jumper or are they a one foot jumper? Is their trunk stable when they're landing and creating breaking horizontal forces or is it pretty like wild? Right. Mm -hmm. I, I think those those are also good things to couple with your standardized repeatable test to see like, OK, um, you know, are they are they a risk taker and are they at risk based on the positions that they're in on the court? And then coupling that to see, OK, we're doing a CMJ every day on the force plate. Do they fluctuate a lot? Does asymmetry get like really large, you know, right to left or breaking versus propulsive when they're also like wild on the court? Yeah. To, to me, huh. like assessing risk taking and then not being consistent with your neuromuscular outputs are two things that you could kind of say, okay, this athlete may be at risk. They're not consistent in their neuromuscular outputs. They're very across the board. And they're also a very big risk taker on the court. So to me, like kind of coupling those two things is really, really important in your evaluation. I love that. Okay. For those who are listening and aren't familiar with these terms, could you talk about what a pro hop and what a cast is? Yeah. So, sorry. So a uh, single leg cast is just uh, on one leg striking well in front of your center of mass. So think of like going into like a pro or a uh, like Euro step mechanism where you're like on one leg and then transfer to the other. It's like kind of like a, a, a leaping mechanism. Mm -hmm. A pro hop is like a direct line drive where you land on two feet and kind of gather yourself and either like, um, you know, go up for a basket shot fake you know, uh, maybe kick it to the corner and go to the opposite corner. So it's just landing on one leg as a single leg cast or landing on two leg as a pro hop. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Now I realize this is a loaded question as everyone and their brother has a, I'll put it in air quotes, uh, an ACL prevention program, <laughs> but you're yeah. up there working with real athletes, uh, at every level over the years. What can we do from a training perspective? to help keep our athletes from an ACL tear? You, you know, that that's a, a really great question. I think there, there's two things. Um, the first, when looking through all known factors, and man, this is so hard to quantify because you don't actually have all the records like of what was going on. There was like a benign injury typically coupled with a lot of these ACLs. For example, like if you look at uh, maybe the three to four weeks leading up to whenever they were injured, we tried to pull everything. And you would see maybe like a DMP uh, ankle, DMP low back, mm. DMP grade one hamstring, right? Yeah. So there was nine kind of injuries or pre-injuries leading up to what was like a catastrophic injury that may have altered mechanics, right? Yes. So again, like when, when you're evaluating your force play or when you're evaluating your athletes in their training and competition, look for fluctuations, right? Look for, okay, this is what their norms are. And they've deviated from these norms big time based on sprained ankle, you know, 
uh, pulled hamstring, you know, uh, whatever it is, right? Uh, so look for deviations from like normative values from a movement standpoint. Uh, as far as your training, again, as an SNC, like your general physical preparation should look, you know, just pretty solid, pretty consistent, right? You yeah. you want to increase power outputs. You want to increase relative strength qualities. You want to increase movement competency on, you know, your, your compound movements, right? But I'd also get with the technical coach and assess risk and assess like how far the athlete is striking outside their center of mass and direct line drives. Do they land on one foot? Do they land on two? When they do land, what is their trunk doing? I think these are all like really important things as it relates to, again, just assessing risk uh, of your athlete, you know, uh, in, in their environment. It's such a great point. And this is one thing that I think a lot of either young strength and conditioning coaches or maybe people that came up in a different era where it's very like just barbell and strength focused. I don't think a lot of people respect the forces that are created in basketball, especially at high level basketball, right? Like it's one thing to go in the gym and and push some weight, respect for that. And I think there's a time and a place for that. But if you watch a guy go full steam down a court, like you said, cast a leg out in front, really stop hard, either Euro step or go up and finish. Like the forces that are going through that athlete's body are massive. And I just don't think a lot of people truly respect and understand how high those forces are. You, you know, it's a brutal sport. It is an absolutely brutal sport. Uh, the the other thing I would say is, you know, rarely was it a direct contact injury, meaning like, a, you know, somebody landed knee to knee yep. and, and blows off in, in ACL. But in the majority of these injuries, there was player to player contact, right? Mm -hmm. So a guy gets, you know, hit in the trunk on a direct line drive, oversteps and then tears their ACL, gets hit in the air, you know, lands awkward, tears their ACL. Like, so there was player to player contact in almost all of these injuries we evaluated. It just wasn't direct contact, right? Mm. So it, it's an absolutely brutal sport, you know? Yeah, that's interesting, man. All right, my guy, big question time. If you could alter the space time continuum and give young Adam Petway one piece of advice, what would it be? You know what? I, I would say it, enjoy the present. I think as a as a younger strength coach and performance coach, I was always like looking for the next thing, the next opportunity. Uh, I think you should always be driven to try to grow and advance, but also like you know things like uh, you know being on a campus where you do have like Olympic level athletes, or just like you know being in high school. You know, one one of my best uh, interns is now a strength coach. I coached him when he was a, a ninth grader, right? Oh, wow. So it's just like appreciating. And I'm actually, you know, probably going to be his uh, PhD supervisor, uh, you know, <laughs> as he gets through. That's and wild. we've known each other for, you know, 12, 14 years now. So I think embracing those types of relationships and opportunities, it's like uh, just kind of, you know, live in the moment. Yeah, I love it, man. Okay, so last but not least, we've got our lightning round. So four fairly short questions. Your answer can be as long or short as you like. Cool? Yeah. All right, here we go. Number one, what's the biggest difference between working in the college sector and the NBA? Oh, that's a great question. I think the, the two biggest things are training age, right? So in college, yes. 18 to 22. In the NBA, you could have 18 to 35 yeah. um, the frequency of competition, right? Uh, so NBA, 82 games, 3.5 per seven days. College, mid 30s, maybe high 30s, 40 if you're lucky. Um, and you play twice a week, right? Yep. So practices are longer, travel is less. Um, in the NBA, you know, rarely practice, but like you're playing every other day. Um, you're traveling all the time. So I think those are the two biggest things. Got it. Okay, number two. We didn't get to talk too much about force plates today. It's something I'm diving into right now. But if you could only test or track three metrics, what would they be? Three, three metrics. Of stuff. How about this? I'll, I'll compromise. I'll give you three that we use every day. I love counter it. Move, counter movement, rebound jump, and then high frequency hop or pogos, right? Okay. And each test will kind of provide something different that we look at counter movement kind of gold standard most studied 
uh, just as an absolute output. What are you doing? Um, you know, hands on hip CMJ rebound looking more more so at like reactive strength index uh, flight flight to jump height or jump height to contact time. You know, what what does that look like and how does that fluctuate? And then with our pogos and, and rebound jumps, we just look at just ankle stiffness qualities okay. and like how, what's the damping ratio? How quickly are you getting off the plate? So we do that every day. Each test kind of gives you a little bit something different, but those are the three. And, uh, you know, we're, we're actually collaborating right now with Hawkins Dynamic. We have uh, plates courtside and, you know, it's really easy. Our guys just walk out there and test every day pre-practice. That's awesome, man. Very cool. Okay, number three. Your favorite road trip city is? Oh, that's a, that's a good one. Uh, <laughs> I'll, say, I get, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two. New York's always great. Yep. Um, just like, you know, best city in the world. So many different types of people, types of food, stuff to do. Uh, and a really underrated one, Toronto is a great city. Okay. Just yeah, a, yeah. Yeah. Toronto's a really good city. Very, uh, again, international city, really cool people. Uh, you know, a lot of really, really good places to eat and stuff to do. So I, I would say those are the two. As an American tool, it's just like a different vibe. Just, yeah, yeah it's, it's different. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's just not good or it's just different. Yeah, it's uh yeah, th but those would be the two. I like Toronto too. That's a good one. All right, last but not least, number 4, what's next for Adam Petway? What are you working on? What are you excited about? Anything? Yeah, I, I think b building out models here. Uh, you know, I think we uh, have a great opportunity here on campus to do a lot of really good stuff. You know, uh Dr. Pat Ivy is uh, you know, our associate athletic director for health and performance. He's doing some amazing work and some a lot of really good spaces. Uh, Dr. Ernie Reimers, our director of sports science here. So it, interfacing with, with those guys um, and just creating initiatives to try to help our student athletes is, is priority number one. Um, I, I would say on top of that, you know, Ryan Richmond and I, uh, who's our co-author for uh, basketball mechanics, we're coming out with our second edition and also doing like, uh, you know, some online webinars and some online content. Um, just because we've gotten a lot of really good feedback on the first book. And I think, you know, we've identified all of these uh, mechanical attributes to tactical situations in basketball. And it's kind of like, you know, you were asking like, OK, you've identified these. Like, what what are you doing with them? So it's going to mm -hmm. be more of an intervention type book and nice. a training manual than just like a biomechanics manuscript. Right. So I think that that's something that Ryan and I have been, you know, building out the last three or four months. But we're really excited uh to to release and now that'll, that'll probably be in the next calendar year so sometime in 2023 dang i gotta wait a whole year to get it yeah well <laughs> okay all right Hopefully you, gotta, well, you yeah. gotta crank it out man that sounds exciting because yeah. i i mean obviously i love to nerd out on this stuff but i'm also and this is why i drove you with some of these questions like i'm big on the practical side right like i want to know what the research says and i want these biomechanical models but then how can we take that and apply it to our training to hopefully keep our athletes healthier right for sure absolutely and that's that's what we're trying to hit uh home on the second edition for sure i love it i love it well adam you've been awesome to chat with today i know you're busy you're like basically in season now so thank you for taking the time to come on where can my listeners find out more about you and all the great work you're doing yeah uh feel free to email me at adampetway at gmail.com um you know I'll, I'll get back with you it may take a day or two but i'll definitely get back and then you know i'm on um you know instagram and linkedin just at, at adam petway um so yeah yeah look, look me up and, and again you know as we put out these papers and as we put out the second edition like i i'd love you know con content feedback man uh i think that's the only way to get better so if there's any you know, constructive criticism out there. Definitely uh, all, all ears on that. I love it. Well, Adam, thank you again for coming on, man. It was really great catching up today. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. I really appreciate it, Mike. All right, my friend, that does it for this week's episode with Adam Petway. Really hope you enjoyed it. This was such a great episode. I really enjoyed talking with Adam a little bit more. It's funny, we actually had some interactions when uh, Glenn Robinson, one of my athletes, got traded from Golden State to Philadelphia. Actually, Adam was there. He was the strength and conditioning coach. So he was the guy that I had initial interactions with, tried to 
you know, just get him up to speed on what I'd done with Glenn in the past, things we'd seen success with. So it was really great to kind of have this come full circle, have him come on the show. And this guy has just put so much time into better understanding Achilles tears, ACL tears. And like I said up top, anything that I can do to better understand how these injuries occur, the biomechanical mechanisms that underpin them, if I can have a better understanding of how these are happening, then hopefully I can create programs to stave them off at a little bit better clip. So really enjoyed it. I hope you did as well. If you're not already subscribed to the show, I mean, I have great guests like this every single week. People that are going to help you move the needle and become a better trainer, coach, or rehab professional. So if you're not already subscribed, go to wherever you consume podcasts and do that right now. It'll take two seconds, but iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, Spotify, the Amazon store, wherever you consume podcasts, go there right now, hit the subscribe button so you know each and every week when a new episode drops. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back next week with our next episode. Take care.